Please join me in welcoming Lois Pace. Lois is an American public health official expert serving as the director of the Office of Global Affairs within the US Department of Health and Human Services. She was executive director of the Global Health Council and member of President-elect Joe Biden's COVID-19 advisory board. Lois Pace was also one of the 15 shortlisted UICC young leaders in 2015, while director of health policy at the Live Strong Foundation. And today, uh, Lois Pace will talk to us about the COVID-19 challenges and responses, maintaining essential health services in times of crisis. To all the leaders connected and watching this session, as always, questions can be asked directly in the live questions chat box. But for now, please join me in welcoming Director Pace. Uh, very good to see you and carry both. Um, I believe you've got a, a short address for us, Lois. Um, so uh, please do go ahead with that and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. And Carrie's also standing by as well. So um, I, I know you two go way back so we can get into uh, <laughs> some details of your friendship as well uh, after your speech. We, go ahead. We do. Thanks very much for this invitation today and uh, greetings to your global audience, it's really quite nice to be here addressing the World Cancer Leaders Summit after uh, so many years uh, living and working among many of you. It's just great to be back. Um, you know, I, um, I appreciate this topic uh, about how we sustain uh, essential services for cancer in the midst of the pandemic that we're still very much experiencing. And I thought I might start um, given where we often start in the cancer community with a personal story, uh, having worked in the field of cancer for um, the time that I did, uh, I know what it feels like um, to get that call from a friend uh, who says, hey, I am facing cancer and I am staring down a barrel and wondering what to do. And that calls often hard and, and scary for all parties uh, and your mind races with, you know, how you can help uh, that friend, right, uh, and be supportive and not invasive. Um, you wonder what sort of resources they have at their disposal, not just medical, um, but practical, right? Um, whether they have childcare, whether they have fertility services, uh, whether they have time off of work for treatment, whether they understand everything they're looking at, right, um, and, and caregiving and other, other areas of support. So then, I keep all this in mind when it comes to COVID-19. And I have to say that it was really hard to get those phone calls from several friends over the past year or so saying, I have cancer and it's COVID. Help me figure out what to do. And there are many things that they were worried about, right? Whether they should delay or pursue treatment, and if so, whether their, their parents uh, or their children um, should be with them during that time, who could take them to and from appointments, uh, let alone um, working with certain specialists and moving around the city to receive diagnoses, if, if not um, therapies. And so that's, that's the reality I think we face with this question. You know, it's not just a, an interesting exercise um, or remarks that I can offer today. Um, but an important lived experience for many people around the world. And so I don't have to tell this audience probably how people have been experiencing cancer during COVID, although I, I will share a couple of the data points that we've been tracking here in our Department of Health. Uh, our Centers for Disease Control, uh, for example, highlighted that over 80% of screenings were down uh, in both breast and cervical cancer um, back in 2020 um, compared to, to averages from years past. And so we knew then early on in, in our experience with the pandemic that this was very much um, going to be a problem. Um, and I mentioned not just um, this uh, experience with, with screening, but also the experience of people I know and I'm sure people you know um, with treatment decisions right, on which timeline um, they would uh, actually be able to undergo treatment, whether that should be compressed or expanded, um, if not delayed entirely, uh, and many of the logistics and decisions that they have to make around treatment and their healthcare providers have to make about treatment, right, whether they uh, delay or further surgeries or immunosuppressive therapies, um, the list goes 
on and on, unfortunately. And so while we're still trying to understand the ramifications of the pandemic on one's cancer experience, we know that it's very real. Uh, and it even falls outside of the healthcare setting. A lot of people don't even think about the medical supply chain, right? Um, and access to therapies, um, either for someone living with cancer or for cancer researchers. Um, one way that we at our Department of Health have tried to solve for this problem actually has been in the area of research and our NIH uh, has been quite thoughtful in how they uh, sort of revisit clinical trials protocols, for example, really looking at uh, whether the adjustments can be made um, so that people don't need to travel to research facilities or sites, but rather stay at home. Uh, and uh, our researchers have looked for opportunities to even liaise with local physician, mailing um, uh, drugs that were being tested directly to patients or providers. And so these innovations uh, are quite important so that we don't disrupt um, the very important work of cancer research, let alone um, some of the other opportunities we have in telemedicine uh, to continue those uh, programs and services. And this is really important because we know who's largely affected by a breakdown in those services or systems, right? It's people who are already experiencing disadvantages and disparities, unfortunately, uh, whether they are racial or ethnic groups that have been historically marginalized, um, whether there's job insecurity and at risk of losing access to care entirely, whether they live in a rural or urban area um, that doesn't really have available uh, the range of uh, services that we know is required. You know, coming back to that screening data I mentioned, the fact that screenings are down over 80% in breast and cervical cancer, when we break that down by racial or ethnic group, for example, we see that uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders, including Hawaiians, that their screening rates are down 90% um, for, for cervical cancer. And for breast cancer, when we look at um, Native Americans or American Indians, that's almost 100%. And so it really is exacerbated in certain groups. Um, again, uh, this is something that our Department of Health is looking at closely, and this administration is very serious about our focus on equity. In fact, our health services and resources um, administration has really tried to uh, bolster its work in telemedicine specifically, um, getting at not only those racial and ethnic disparities, but some of those geographic ones as well. And I'm happy to, to get into detail as to how that part of our agency is approaching its work. But I'll just um, close uh, by really saying, look, I, I hope that, that these remarks and are sort of echoing um, your own understanding of the problem but also our collective solution to the problem. We know it exists, um, but we also know that we can solve for it and we can solve for it in real time. We don't have to wait for this pandemic to be over uh, to address it necessarily. And really it comes down to the same mantra that many of us in public health or global health have been stating over time. The world needs resilient, person-centered health systems more than anything else, right? these processes and protocols that can withstand various shocks. And not only for infectious diseases, right, uh, like HIV or malaria, um, or for programs like childhood immunizations or maternal or reproductive health, but we need them for chronic diseases, right? Because cancer is a global problem, just like COVID. And so just like COVID, you and I and the U.S. government needs to be committed to fighting this and finding some way to continue working with our partners around the world to ensure people's needs are met and that everyone can live at this high standard when it comes to their own health and well-being. So thanks again very much for having me. And I'm happy to have a, a conversation 
with Carrie yeah. for as long as time allows. <laughs> okay, great. Lois, um, wonderful to hear from you. Um, it's fascinating what you said in terms of the stats. It's frightening in some cases as well when you're talking about screening levels especially. Um, but but so important, obviously, that, that we kind of look at cancer and cancer care in the cancer community in the context of COVID-19 and look at the, the positives and the negatives of what we can learn from it as well as what's been exacerbated and, and needs to get under control straight away. Um, Lois, we're going to come to some questions to you from the audience very shortly and I'll bring Kerry into that. But in the meantime, I just want to um, put a couple of questions to you, Kerry, uh, particularly about the impact of COVID-19. I mean, you've got um, an organization with 1,200 members worldwide, everyone, not just cancer patients, but the entire cancer community has been impacted by the pandemic. How have your members coped? What sort of survival strategies have they put into place over the last two years? Well, it's been very difficult. And in fact, you know, Lois's error has started off with the patient and quite rightly, I mean, all the cancer organizations that are members of UIC think patient, 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 either avoiding cancer or getting great early diagnostics and then and treatment. But the truth is the organizations that are members of UIC have suffered financially. Mm. You no, know, it's been the, the hidden challenge that we've had right through the COVID period is the ability to raise funds for many of our organisations has somewhat disappeared. No walks, no rides, no gala dinners, no getting together, all those sort of things. And this has placed a financial pressure on the NGO sector generally, but specifically in the health sector as well. And the cancer organisations have suffered. Now, why is this important? It's because the NGO sector, the Cancer Society, Cancer Leagues, patient groups, are a critical part of that health system. They're the ones that are touching the patients more than most, I imagine. They're mm. supporting them and their families. They're addressing some of the financial challenges, which I know uh, Livestrong, one of um, um, uh, Lois's previous organizations, was really keen on supporting the family unit through the challenges of a cancer diagnosis. So we've seen a lot of our members struggle just to keep their own organization going and delivering the services into the patient population that's been demanded through you know, some challenging times. And Lois, any reflections on what Kerry's just said then, and not just from NGOs as well, civil society, broadly speaking, I mean, what impact have all of these organizations had on trying to combat COVID-19 throughout in the middle of a in the middle of a global pandemic no it's been very tough for for civil society actors uh, they come uh calling us here in the u.s government obviously i used to be on that side of the of the table uh and uh can very much understand um that it's very hard to to break through right um with one's messages what i've seen though and i'm encouraged by is these groups coming together because again it's about people's lived experiences, whether they were cancer or COVID um, or other issues entirely. And what I'm hearing come from advocates in their campaigns um, is sort of a coalescing around these very real central or human-centered issues, really speaking of access to health broadly, which I think is an important message for policymakers and others to hear. Mm. And Lois, some of the questions that we've had coming in are from the audience are talking about the inequities uh, in access to cancer care that have been sort of exacerbated perhaps by COVID-19. I know you addressed that already. And because we're tight of time, I'm going to uh, move on to some other questions as well. I'm wondering if there are any advocacy efforts in particular that stood out for you. Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that... You know, the, the groups that do rally around primary health care in particular, um, I think they have some very poignant messages because it's, you know, they're very cross-cutting um, and help us understand how primary health care services, and again, not just address um, sort of other issues uh, sort of before people develop cancer or sort of the, the I guess, the more traditionally defined mm -hmm. uh, community health services. Um, but can level up. And Carrie and I have been talking about this for decades. I think it's really coming through now how urgent that is. Um, also, this connection to the rallying cries for solidarity around COVID, um, particularly um, thinking through how we can ensure any future innovations reach those um, equitably around the world. And so that's playing out right now when it comes to COVID vaccines, let alone treatments and diagnostics. But now, how do we apply these lessons and these solutions to other issues like cancer or even um, malaria, given their new vaccine? So that's been an yeah. interesting um, advocacy message as well. And that's actually, it's interesting that you just said that about 
sort of innovating quickly and in a collaborative way. The, the speed of vaccines that we've seen for COVID-19, for example, I, you know, one of the questions yes. that's come in is how can we learn lessons from that and, and move that into cancer care as well? That's right. Yeah, people have talked about leveraging mRNA platforms for this purpose, but even just broadly speaking about R&D, really just changing our idea of the possible, right, and, and leveling up our ambitions. When the president was talking about the cancer moonshot during the Obama administration, I don't think people could really see it. But now that we've been able to develop uh, vaccine, vaccines and other innovations for COVID in less than a year, that ideal doesn't seem so far off. And so we're yeah. very excited as a government to be thinking differently about our own push towards innovation and research. Well, we have to leave it there because we are, have run out of time now. But Lois, it's been wonderful to have you uh, join us for this World Cancer Leaders Summit. Thank you so much for your time.